Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to Video Notes for Topic 6.13, which is Energy Conservation. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe methods for conserving energy, uh, both on a large scale and a small scale. And then the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will be calculating an answer with appropriate units. Now we'll take a look at both some small scale and large scale energy conservation methods. Uh, so one simple way to conserve energy is to turn down the heat in your home. Uh, even better, you can get a pro uh, programmable thermostat, which will enable you to set kind of predetermined temperatures that you want. And this just allows you to use less energy overall. Another option can be using sort of what we would call native vegetation or native plants around your home. This can decrease the amount of water you use uh, because water is energy. It takes electricity oftentimes to purify water and to pump it out to your home. So any way that you can conserve water, that is a way to conserve energy. And then finally, we can improve the insulation of our homes or improve the efficiency of our appliances. So some appliances are able to do the same task, just use less overall electricity. Uh, same idea with insulation. If we can insulate our homes better, the amount of heat that we generate from the furnace or from another heating system will stay in the home and we'll have to use less overall energy. Uh, and the same concept applies to cooling. So we'll look at specific ways to do this in a little bit. And then if we take a look at large scale ideas, one thing that we can do is increase the fuel economy of the vehicles in America. So when fuel economy goes up, that's just the average amount of gasoline required to drive a mile. That means that we can travel the same distance using less gasoline. So we'll talk more about those standards and things that can be done to improve them. Another method that we can do is to basically subsidize or offer uh, rebates for companies that wanna build electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging stations. That's going to incentivize these companies to build these vehicles, to make them cheaper so that more consumers can afford them. And that, of course, is going to decrease gasoline and therefore energy consumption. And one final thing we can do is invest in public transportation. So buses, light rails, anything that enables a massive amount of people uh, to move around in one vehicle like this is going to drastically decrease the total amount of energy that we have to spend on transportation. Now we'll talk a little bit about sustainable home design which is just the idea that we can design our homes more intentionally in order to take advantage of the natural heat from the sun's energy in different times of the year, but also just to insulate our homes better and keep more of the heating and cooling in them that we generate. So the first way is called using a deciduous sh uh, shade tree. And these are trees that are broad leaves where they will provide shade in the summer months. That means you have to use less electricity to cool your home. And then in the winter months, those trees lose their leaves, and so the sunlight's able to come through and provide some natural warming. Another thing that can be done is using passive solar design. Passive solar design, uh, which would also include the deciduous shade tree, it would include other things like having materials that will absorb the sun's natural heat, like either brickwork or dark colored flooring, and then double or triple paned windows that will trap that heat in, almost using the greenhouse effect uh, to heat your home in those cooler winter months. And then finally, we can make sure that there's adequate insulation. So insulation is any sort of product that's put into the wall or the ceiling to basically trap in either the heat or the air conditioned air. And so again, when you have better insulation, you lose less heat or less uh, cool air to the surrounding environment. And that means you can keep your house at a stable temperature by using less total energy. Now we'll talk about some water conservation strategies. And remember that because water takes energy to both purify and pump out to houses or businesses, that represents a form of energy conservation. One really neat way to do this is by removing turf or grass and replacing it with native vegetation. So native plants are uniquely adapted to the surrounding climate. So they don't need nearly as much water to sustain them. They also don't need as much fertilizer. Uh, and another benefit, which isn't necessar necessarily energy conservation, is increased biodiversity. Typically, plants that are native will be home uh, you know, shelter and food to a lot more variety of organisms than we find with a grass or a turf front yard. Another thing that can be done is low flow uh, water heads that could be in your shower, uh, low flow toilets, or just low water appliances. So a dishwasher could be a great example here. And then finally, you can use a rain barrel to capture rainwater. And then that rainwater could be used to water your garden or to wash, you know, your sidewalk or your front steps or even your car. So that's a way that you can, again, take advantage of natural rainwater instead of having water pumped out to your home from a municipal plant that had to treat the water as well. So all of these are ways to save energy when it comes to water usage. If we want to talk about larger scale ways to conserve energy, these would be on more of a state or national level. 
Transportation is a great place to look. So 28% of the US total energy use in 2019 went to transportation. And that's both goods and people. So shipping, you know, as well as moving people around. And so one way that we can target this and try to conserve energy here is with what we call the CAFE standards. So it stands for the corporate average fuel economy. And what it is, is basically a measure of the average MPG or miles per gallon that the fleet, meaning all of the vehicles in America, small vehicles, that is, we don't really count like semi trucks or trucks over a certain weight. But again, it's basically the standard that's required by automakers. So automakers are required by the government to make vehicles that on average across all of their different models that they sell achieve certain standards. And by raising those over time, we can travel the same distance and use less gasoline or less fuel. So this is a great way to think about energy conservation. Another way that this can be done is with hybrid vehicles. So the Prius is a great example of this. A hybrid vehicle I want to point out here has both a gasoline engine as well as an electric motor. And so what happens is that the braking system of the Prius actually charges an electric battery. So if we take a look at the schematic, um, some Priuses, uh, pre I, I don't know how you pluralize that. Um, I drive one, I ought to know, but some can be plugged in where you'll charge the battery and then the battery basically supplies energy to this electric motor, which assists with the gasoline engine. And that's going to allow the gasoline engine to travel a lot further while using less gasoline. Uh, but many hybrids, and I think what's more common really is a hybrid where the braking system actually charges the battery, which is really neat. So you don't have to plug it in and use an electrical source. Uh, another really popular form of alternative transportation that does enable us to conserve some energy is electric vehicles. So this would be things like the Tesla or the Nissan Leaf. One thing I wanna point out though, is that they are only as sustainable as the electricity that is used to fuel them. And so you can actually look up in different states how environmentally friendly or how sustainable your electric vehicle really is because different states get their electricity from different mixtures. And then finally, if you want a safer option, I would say, or a more surefire way to ensure that you're decreasing your per person you know, energy consumption for transportation, public transit is a great idea or carpooling. And so anytime, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, you can get you know, dozens of people into one vehicle and transport them, that's almost always going to be more efficient than people taking their own individual vehicles. So we talked a little bit about home sustainable design. Now we'll talk about more large scale sustainable business design or sustainable building design. So again, it's the same idea though. It's decreasing the amount of energy required to both construct the building, but then also to heat and to cool it. So here's one great example of that is adding what we would call a green roof or in this case, a green wall. So a green roof is simply adding plants to the roof of a building or to the side of the building, as we can see here. And that does a couple things. Uh, it's going to give you some air quality benefits. It's also going to sequester a little bit of carbon dioxide, but the real benefit is from an electricity standpoint. These plants are going to absorb a lot of sunlight and that's gonna heat the building less. So the building can use less electricity for its air conditioning system. It may even also impact the buildings around it if this is used widely enough because it decreases the urban heat island effect. Remember, this is the idea that dark colored surfaces like blacktop, asphalt, concrete, and uh, you know, other building materials will absorb the sun's heat. And so when we reflect it instead with plants, that is going to decrease our electricity use. Then we can also look at sunlight or having natural lighting. And so you can have a sunlight in the roof, but you can also have floor to ceiling windows like this. And that's gonna enable more natural lighting, less electricity to be used to light the building. And then finally, we can even use recycled materials when we're building. So glass is very recyclable, as is wood, depending on its condition. And then we can even use something called fly ash, which comes from coal fired power plants that can be used to create gypsum wallboard, which can be used in walls and the foundation of buildings. And lastly, we'll talk about something called peak electricity demand and how to manage that with a variable price system. So this is the idea that at certain times of day, uh, typically at night when folks are getting home, powering on their devices, lights are flipping on, and when solar electricity is going offline, that's a typical peak demand in many places, but it can also be during hot weather events where air conditioning units are really cranked up and we're using a lot more electricity than normal. So this is a problem because if the demand exceeds the amount of electricity that can be supplied by the utility, there's going to be rolling blackouts. So people will lose their power for periods of time. Now, one way to address this is like I mentioned at the beginning, a 
variable price system or sometimes a tiered rate system. So this is the idea that you are going to actually pay a different rate depending on how much electricity you use. So if we look at the red bar here in a fixed rate, when you use a lower amount of electricity, you're going to pay a lower amount per kilowatt hour. But we can see here, uh, and we should actually be looking at the blue bar, sorry. When we get to a month where this individual used a ton of electricity, uh, their monthly usage was higher and their bill went way up and that's because they used electricity at a higher rate. So it basically tries to discourage or incentivize users to use less overall electricity, to buy more efficient appliances or use a smart thermostat or something else to basically rein in their electricity consumption a little bit. Then the final thing we have to cover here is something called a smart grid. And a smart grid is not so much one specific thing as it is a concept. The idea of a smart grid is the idea of using computers and smart thermostats and smart meters to basically try to create a more integrated electricity system. And so this graphic can be helpful for understanding. In the yesterday idea or the grid of the past, we have just a couple large uh, power plants and then it's a mostly centralized method of distribution. And then it's only going out to the consumer. They just pay in and they get the electricity from the utility. In a more integrated and what we might call a smart grid system, there's a bunch of different power producers and they can be decentralized. So we might have community owned solar where a certain neighborhood or county actually owns their own solar farm or wind farm. Uh, and then we have integration. So we have batteries to potentially store electricity and use it later. And then we have two way direction of electricity. So this is the idea that rooftop solar could even generate extra electricity and be sent back to the grid in times of excess when it could be used by other consumers. So all of these ideas would fall into this overall concept of a smart grid. All right, in practice FRQ 6.13 today, we are gonna practice calculating an answer with proper units. So I want you to take a look at this graph here and calculate the percent change in global investment in renewable energy from 2004 to 2014. 